Today on BRS TV Investigates, it's air versus water, what's the best test? Hi, I'm Ryan, your host of BRS TV Investigates, a weekly YouTube series which explores popular reefing theories, products, methods, what the manuals are missing, with a focus on putting them to the test, and then rate that theory based on our scale of reef fantasy to reef certainty. This week we're going to explore a fairly common question related to the lighting testing we do. What's the best way to take PAR measurements to get an accurate picture of how the light source performs not only against its competitors, but also how it performs in its intended application, which is inside a reef tank? Many reefers believe taking measurements in air gives the most accurate picture of light performance, and others believe taking measurement in a water-filled aquarium is the best approach. So do underwater PAR tests give more valuable results? We're going to find out the answer today. Open and honest, this episode's a bit data filled, but if you can make your way through it, you'll likely find some cool insights, not only about selecting the right light or tuning the one you already own, but about how light behaves in general, particularly inside a glass box that's filled with water. All these PAR measurements matter because it's this data that the community uses to both help each other identify what light is the best option for our specific needs, as well as hopefully giving some amount of insight on in how to use this intelligently and install and tune the lights to achieve reefer specific goals. Prior to testing, our initial research has led us to believe that testing in air is probably the most accurate way to produce reliable results with the fewest interferences or variables, and very likely the best way to give a general impression of how one light will perform against another. Testing in air means there's very limited reflection or refraction issues from the water or glass, and we don't have to deal with the distorted data from variations in mounting height or hundreds of different lights over 50 different tank sizes that will absolutely distort that data. This is almost certainly why historically you see most of the PAR testing data on reef tank light sources done in air. That said, we're not using these lights in air, we're using them in a glass tank filled with water which has significant reflection and refraction variables based on the characteristics of the light fixture itself as well as the glass and water. This is why the BRS team is always tested in water. Today we're going to get a better picture of not only if that's best, but hopefully uncover some dynamics of light which can be used to more intuitively use our lights to produce real reef tank related results. To do that, we need a minute or two refresher on how light reflection and refraction works when it hits water. I'll try to keep this as ungeeky as possible so we can get to the heart of today's test, starting with reflection. I think everyone's seen a still image of a lake and some background scene reflected off its surface. That image you're seeing is, in fact, light reflected off the surface of the water towards your eye. No different than if you look at the still surface of a tank and see your aquarium light reflected back at you. The light from that fixture is bouncing off the surface of the water towards your eye. When traveling light hits the water, some portion of that light's always going to reflect back off the surface, and some portion of that light will be transmitted into the water. How much light enters the water is largely dependent on the angle the light hits the water. At narrow angles closer to zero degrees, the vast majority of the light is transmitted directly into the water. At larger angles, a large portion of the light is actually reflected off the surface of the water and relatively little is transmitted into the water. So for our purposes in reefing, it's probably accurate to assume with many of the popular light sources to see an increasing percentage of light reflected off the water the further you get from the light source itself. However, in an aquarium, there's one more component of reflection as well, and that's the glass. Once the light's transmitted into the water, some of it's ultimately going to hit the glass walls of the tank, which can also either reflect the light back into the tank or allow it to pass through and essentially transmit it back into the air or room the tank is in. Most reefers don't spend much time thinking about the reflective properties of glass. Hopefully today, we'll find out if we should. The other major component of this is refraction, meaning when the light hits the water's surface, it changes direction. Something most of you have witnessed when viewing an object that's been partially submerged in water and it appears bent. The impact of refraction is compounded as the angle at which the light hits the water gets larger and larger as well. I found a video on KhanAcademy.org which describes this concept fairly well. Imagine a car driving on pavement toward a barrier of thick mud. If you drive straight at it, the wheels will simultaneously hit the mud and the car will likely slow down but continue going in a straight line. The same with light. Most of the light traveling straight at the surface of the water will transmit into the water and continue on the same path at which it came in. However, the car drove into the mud at an angle. As soon as the right wheel hits, it will slow down that portion of the car and it will begin to turn until the other wheel also hits the mud, slows down, and then the car will continue to travel in a straight line from there. The larger the angle at which the car hits the mud, the longer it will take for the left wheel to catch up and the larger change in direction of the car or refraction will be. 
apply to the reef tank at least to some degree. The further you get from the light source, the larger the refraction will be and more of the light will be directed downward into the tank rather than in a straight line at the side of the tank. Now this is getting a bit like science class and less like a hobby, but that's a general concept and we're about to apply it to our reef tanks. I'm pretty sure we'll be able to bring some of these concepts home by seeing their impact in today's PAR test. Our test includes two different types of light sources and the leaders of the respected technologies. The first light source is representative of a smaller compact form factor with the Radeon XR30 G4 Pro, which is by far the most common form factor used by reefers today. The second is a large diffused light source with a 24 inch 8 bulb ATI T5 fixture with aqua blue special bulbs. T5s are not as common these days, but the large light source, good or bad, is almost certainly going to show some pretty distinct differences in terms of how it reflects and refracts light once the glass and water are involved. I'm pretty sure the air results between these two light sources will be fairly predictable and uniform in shape. However, once the water and glass is in play, I think it might shake up all of our understanding quite a bit. We're going to test in three different environments, a 30 inch grid in air, a 30 inch grid underwater, and a 30 inch grid underwater with significant surface agitation, which is most similar to a real world aquarium environment. Our expectation is at least to some degree the surface agitation will impact reflection and refraction and change the diffusion or spread of light in the tank. To get a stable reading from the surface agitated test, we set the LeCore PAR logger to take an average of 15 seconds. Last piece of this is in all these environments we tested at multiple depths of 12, 18, and 24 inches from the light source. I think we all want to know what's happening at the top of the tank as well as what's happening near the bottom because it's not as linear or flat as you might think. Not only that, but the reflective properties of the glass very likely has a significant impact at different heights and taking measurements at multiple heights gives you a much better understanding of this impact. We're going to start with the Radeon XR30 G4 Pro at a depth of 12 inches in air. This close to the sensors, the light has a fairly predictable oval pattern with center peaks in the 800s and falling off towards the edges. Due to the rectangular design, the light fall off is less significant left to right than it is front to back, which is desirable in most rectangular aquariums. Now let's take a look at what happens when we take the same readings in water with the radion positioned at the manufacturer suggested 9 inches over water. The LeCore PAR sensors are still positioned 12 inches below the actual light, so they're only submerged in 3 inches of water. Most people are not keeping corals as shallow, but you can already see a significant impact in PAR by testing under water rather than air. The average from all 36 points with air measurements is 296. However, taking it underwater at the exact same distance, it drops to 205, which is an average drop of about 29%. Some of you might be surprised that three inches of water is having that significant of an impact on par. Refraction and reflection are absolutely impacting the amount of light that's transmitted into the tank. It's also important to note that the fall off between the two different environments isn't uniform as well. The reduction in par and water is progressively larger the further and further you get from the light. Looking at the four points in the center six inches where the light is close to directly over the sensors, the impact of the water reduces the average par from 861 to 660 or around 23%. However, the further you get from the light source, the impact gets more significant. In the mid-range 18-inch ring, the water is reducing the 12-point average par from 449 to 307, or 31%, which is 8% more than the center. On the outer 30-inch ring, which is pretty far from the light source, the water is reducing the par from 93 to 54, or 41% over the air readings, so the percentage in light loss on the outer edge of the cube is almost double that of the center. The progressive impact demonstrated here is very likely a result of both reflection and refraction. In air, there's very little preventing the light from reaching the sensor, and it just takes a direct path. Once we incorporated even three inches of water, there's now a barrier between the light and sensor, and the further the sensor is from the light, the larger the angle of the light hitting the surface of the water, which both increases loss of light due to reflection off the water's surface, as well as refracting the light which is transmitted into the tank away from the edges. Looking at our next set of measurements, 18 inches from the light source, we see a similar impact in an overall 36 point average drop from 260 to 208, or 20% less par transmitted into the tank. However, the fall off behavior is significantly different. The four point average of the center six inches drops from 445 to 390, which is only 12%. The mid-range 18-inch ring drops from an average of 347 to 277, which is 20%. And the outside 30-inch ring drops from 171 in air to 130 in water, or 26%. 
So proportionally, the difference between the 12, 20, and 26% fall off isn't drastically different than the previous height, but we're seeing a less significant impact between the air and water readings, particularly in the center. Again, this is almost certainly related to how the light reflects and refracts in its path to the sensor. With the sensors 18 inches from the light or 6 inches deeper than the previous set of tests, the angle required to reach the sensor isn't as large as it was prior, which is likely resulting in less reflection off the water surface and less refraction away from the sensor at this depth. With the last set of air water measurements for the radion, which is placing the light 2 feet or 24 inches from the sensors, we're seeing something very different, with the overall drop in light from air to water on a 36-point average dropping from 201 to 185, which is only an 8% decrease. That's likely because as we go deeper, we have again reduced the angle required to cross the air-water interface between the light source and the sensor, but a new effect is also likely starting to be more noticeable, which is the light reflecting off the glass and being redirected into other areas of the tank. Because of how reflection angles work, this will often be more impactful at the bottom half of the tank than the top, particularly with small compact light sources like this one. This is something you can even see visually represented in the surface chart as well. In air, with almost nothing to block or redirect the light, the PAR output is still represented in a nice uniform circle. Looking at the pattern of the underwater measurements, you can see quite a few things are starting to happen to the light and it's pretty far from uniform. So what's causing that odd pattern? Well, if you look at the center four-point average, the loss of light from air to water is now 17%. However, the mid-range 18-inch ring has just dropped to 11%, which is the first time where we've seen a smaller drop of light by percentage in the mid-range ring than the center of the tank, almost certainly the result of light reflecting off the glass. Now, that outside 30-inch ring, we saw an average drop of just 3 par, or less than 2%, which is almost nothing. Again, almost certainly the impact of light reflecting off the glass and bouncing around the tank. That's something that's going to change a lot, depending on the size, depth, and shape of the glass box. You put your light over, which is, again, why most of the par numbers offered to the community are done with air measurements. So my general take on our findings so far with the compact light sources, there's a pretty significant difference between the air and water measurements. But with a general understanding of how light reflects and refracts at different levels, you might be able to use the air or water readings to make some fairly safe assumptions about how light is being redistributed in the tank. But I'm going to hold off my final opinion for when all the tests are completed. Moving on to the impact of the water movement provided by the two MP10s at the surface, mimicking a standard tank environment, most of the team here thought the surface ripples would have a fairly significant scattering effect caused by the surface ripples impacting refraction, angle the light enters the tank, and how that light is dispersed. I will share the data for those of you that want to see it, but I'll save the suspense. Even though we really thought the surface agitation and ripples would significantly impact the distribution of light, we saw very little impact at 12 inches and only subtle impacts at 18 and 24. The ripples are impacting the light to a small degree, but I don't think it's of tremendous value considering what a huge variable flow and resulting breaks in surface tension is. Certainly much less impactful than many of us thought. Based on this, I wouldn't bother adding surface agitation to future tests. Moving on to a wider angle diffused light source with the ATI T5 fixture, we felt it was most valuable to install the light at a common height specific to a T5 fixture. We couldn't find a direct manufacturer suggested mounting height, so we installed the fixture at 7 inches over the water, which seemed to be about the median of what the BRS team suggested, which means the sensors are under 5 inches of water to achieve the 12 inches from the sensor. The primary reason we wanted to test a significantly different or larger type of light source like this is because I have a strong expectation that glass and water is going to have a significantly different impact with a large diffused light source and provide us some useful insight in how to use a light like this. That turned out to be a fairly accurate prediction. In this case, taking measurements 12 inches from the sensor at all 36 points, we saw a drop from 191 to 168, which is only a 12% reduction in par between the air and water measurements rather than the 30% we saw with the previous light. I believe this is largely because the large diffused light source is producing light at narrower angles which are more likely to enter the tank over a wide area rather than reflect off its surface. With a light design like this, some of the light could also be potentially recaptured by the large array of reflectors and be redirected back into the tank. The fallout from the center, however, was significantly different. At 12 inches under the light, the center 6 inch area only had a 14% drop in light from the water. The mid-range 18-inch ring had a 20% drop, however that outside 30-inch ring had an average increase of almost 3%, meaning underwater that outside ring is measuring more light than in air. 
This is almost certainly an impact of light reflecting off the glass back into the tank because the light source is so large, even at this very shallow depth of only five inches of water, light from the large fixture is already hitting the glass and being redirected around the tank, particularly the edges. Dropping down to 18 inches from the sensors, we saw a similar impact. However, believe it or not, the water measurements are now higher than the air measurements. Again, the most significant impact from the glass. In air, a huge portion of light from this large light source would likely spill outside the 30-inch grid. Inside a glass aquarium, a significant portion of that light is being redirected off the glass back into the tank. At 18 inches from the light in the center, 6 inches, there's only a 5% reduction in PAR. Mid-range 18-inch ring, just a 2% reduction. In the outer 30-inch ring, there's actually a 25% increase in PAR underwater versus air. Net impact of this redistribution of light is the left to right variance are almost flat, which a lot of reefers might find ideal. I'm sure most of you won't be surprised that this effect is continued at 24 inches from the light. However, in this case, the average 36 point measurement of all points is actually 27% higher underwater than in air. There's only a one par difference in the center six inch average. The mid range 18 inch ring is 14% higher underwater and the outside 30 inch is an amazing 50% higher underwater. All because at this depth, the glass is reflecting or redirecting light all over the tank. This redistribution of light is actually producing what a lot of people might have thought was impossible with just basically a 10 par difference from left to right over an entire 30 inch grid using just a 24 inch wide light. Some of you might have anticipated a change like this because you already understood the dynamics of reflection and refraction with a light source like this, but I think many of you might be pretty surprised how big of a difference glass and water has played in all of our readings today. For what it's worth, we also repeated the test with the MP10s to simulate surface agitation, and there was even less impact in this case. I really thought we would have had a significant impact, but in the end, it's just not a valuable variable to test. So now that we have all the results, what's better, testing PAR in air or water? Well, I'm going to have to say that I'm going to have a hard time definitively saying either way, because even though the water results have been pretty compelling, all the results we shared today were based on a 30-inch cube aquarium, which is valuable to 30-inch cube owners, but much less valuable to someone who owns a different shape or size tank. However, open and honest, I also don't find the air test to be particularly valuable either because they don't provide a tremendous amount of insight in how the lights are going to perform in their intended use environment, which is a reef aquarium and almost universally inaccurate from that perspective. If you understand light dynamics really well, you can likely use the knowledge from an air test to intuitively form an educated guess as to how that would apply to your aquarium shape, but I think that might prove fairly difficult for most reefers to do with a reasonable degree of accuracy. So how do we give an answer to today's question? Do underwater PAR tests give more valuable results? I pulled a few of the BRS team members here and they universally agreed if they could only have one set of data to evaluate, select, and set up the right light for their reef tanks, the measurements taken in an actual aquarium environment would help them more, even if they have to compensate for a different tank size. So I'm going to give this a hair win of a 6 on a 10 point scale and call it a narrow reef certainty. Now that said, I think both are valuable and the best solution is certainly to offer both sets of data and potentially a variety of filled tank sizes as well. Not only did we get an answer to a pretty common question today, I think we're going to use today's data to change our light testing model a bit in the future and hopefully provide even more valuable data to all of you in the future. So I'm dying to know what all of you think, so please share your thoughts in today's poll, air or water, or in the comments area down below. This week we're setting up our first long-term test, which is to determine how effective Kato really is at removing nutrients. It'll be a couple months before the results are in, but it should be fun to share the results with everyone. If you like what we're doing here, please remember to give us a quick thumbs up and subscribe. See you next week with another BRS TV Investigates.